All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning. My name is Jerron Bell, Senior Associate Research Data Analyst for the Missouri Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development. Uh, this morning, I have the pleasure uh, of introducing the Hear Me, See Me Day 2 2021 Equity in Missouri Higher Education Summit uh, presenters, uh, my colleagues from Stevens College. Uh, but before we get started, some virtual conference etiquette going to go over all participants should stay muted to eliminate any background noise. What uh, we want to see your faces. So if you have a camera capabilities, uh, please turn that on to better engage with us. All present all presentations uh, will be live. So bear with us with any technical issues. The chat will be monitored uh, by myself and uh, by me and uh, for any questions throughout the presentation. So put those in the chat. Um, if you're into a session, uh, but you decide that this is not for you, please close out and head to a different session. Uh, just like you would any other conference in person and all sessions will be recorded. So you'll be able to access these after the conference is over. Don't forget to engage with us on social media using equity hashtag equity 2021 at mo D H E W D and also on our new conference website. With that, I will introduce my two colleagues from Stevens College and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much, Jerron. Greetings, conference attendees, Missouri educators, Missouri administrators, policymakers, people for whom students are their why. It is our privilege to spend some time with you this morning exploring the journey of the equity offices plus compliance at Stevens College and providing you with some takeaways, some thoughts, reflections, practices for you in intentional work with diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, and belonging on your campus. So Shoshana and I are here today um, coming to you live from Stevens College. Stevens was founded in 1833 and has earned the distinction of being the second oldest women's college in the country. At one time, Stevens was one of about 200 of such institutions and is now one in about 31 or 32 of those left. In addition to enrolling women, we enroll men in our co-educational graduate programs. And I can tell you that our students today are exactly like they were in the past. They are bold leaders out-of-the-box thinkers, maverick creatives who are making her story, their story, and history. I would first like to introduce to you my colleague here, Shashan. She is Stevens College's inaugural director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Shoshana identifies as being unapologetically black, queer, an army brat, and rocks about hundreds more wonderful identities. She is also a charismatic leader with a distinctive voice, a champion of difficult, sometimes uncomfortable discourse that can spark change on a college campus. And she possesses an exhaustive, innumerable list of talents and skills. Well, thank you, my colleague, and good morning, colleagues. It's my pleasure to introduce you to my amazing colleague, Sadie Mayer Strand. She serves as the director of the Student Success Center, the Margaret Campbell Student Success Center at Stevens College, in addition to being the Section 504 ADA coordinator with Stevens College. And she is an unapologetic woman, a meditation and yoga practitioner. She gets her power from nature and traveling, and she is so connected to her blood family and families of choice. So she's a champion for and with people with visible and invisible disabilities and an aspiring co-conspirator, not just ally or accomplice, but co-conspirator for people of color. Thank you, Shashan. And we have one last person I would like to introduce to you. This person is not with us this morning, but she is an equally important, crucial part of our equity offices triad, and that is Shannon Walls. Shannon Walls is the Title IX coordinator for Stevens College and the special assistant to the president. And if it wasn't for Shashan's diligent, hard work and hours and hours of being in the weeds with policy and procedure, um, we wouldn't quite be who we are today at the equity offices and the students at Stevens College 
would not be afforded the types of protections and wonderful, wonderful facilitations for Title IX without her expertise. So let's get started. Let's make this an experience. So we hope that the next couple slides will provide you with call to actions and promising practices. So our offices began to collaborate about two years ago uh, to support one another in a unified grievance process. And Sadie's gonna give you a little bit more information on that. Yes. So we started this, um, as Tashan said, um, two years ago, just trying to figure out a way that we could all share one discrimination complaint process. And that was in fall of 2019. But then spring of 2020 came, COVID hit. We went home and we were Zooming from our homes and bedrooms in our homes. Um, we were craving human connection. Our offices all of a sudden, and we felt <laughs> the same, we felt uh, siloed even more and just lonely. So we started Zooming just so we could see each other, even if it was on screen. And through those meetings came a vision for even a greater collaboration, not just one that shared policy and procedure, but that one that could benefit all of our campus community in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So out of that comes some suggestions from our journey, uh, comes some suggestions for you in building maybe an equity offices uh, collaboration similar to what we have at Stevens College. Awesome, so we just wanna do a little bit of framing in that our offices on the hierarchical flow chart of Stevens College are three separate units. So what we're sharing today was our intentional decision to collaborate, to think about each other. If I'm in a meeting, I need to be thinking about ADA, what questions would Sadie ask and Title IX and vice versa. And from that really is what we're gonna share with you today. So again, these are our promising practices, recommendations, call to actions, and we hope uh, you'll get some out of it. So our first recommendation is to literally carve out some time to pause, reflect, and map out aspirations. How did we do that? We did either two hour meetings or what we would call a half day retreat, which we were just in the library on the third <laughs> floor, but it was the three of us to block out times of our schedules. And literally we printed out our policies. We laid them out on a conference table and started to highlight or make notes or inform each other of what you did, what I didn't know about ADA or what Sadie didn't know about the uh, you know, uh, DEI, what Shannon didn't know. And so we encourage you to do that. The second tip would be explicitly name and define your constituents. Now, some of you may be like, you're underselling me here. You're underwhelming me. But if you really think about it, most of your literature probably does not spell out whom you serve. So at Stevens, for instance, the women's undergraduate college gets tons of attention. There's people in Como who don't even know we have graduate programs. And so one of our decisions was in our emails, in uh, our website, in parentheses, you'll often see undergraduate students, graduate students, faculty, staff, alumni, and Columbia, Missouri residents. So we are explicitly naming whom we serve, the constituents that we are trying to serve. And obviously, you know, we can go either further and go part-time faculty, full-time faculty, part-time staff, full-time staff. So explicitly put out who you're serving. And the third tip would be, and this is where we really started to gel, is review and map your policies, your processes, your regulatory bodies to find out what your commonalities are and where you are overlap. Because what we found out really quickly was for an intersectional student, they could very well have to fill out three different forms and follow three different processes. And that is traumatic and it's too much. And so once we actually printed, laid out our policies and started to figure out, well, who's the most regulated? Title IX. Who's the second? ADA. Who's really the least regulated? DEI. So we made the conscious effort to make sure that any policy, that that one policy was up to the level of Title IX. And then that way we know we were doing beyond what we're called to do legally and compliant. Um, and the other tip for that is most of you, if you're like us, had all kinds of copies with different dates on these policies. They were posted in all kinds of different locations on old and new websites because we did a, a web relaunch in 
fall of 19 yes or spring of 20 mm -hmm. and so just tracking down all of that removing them figuring out mm -hmm. what copy your faculty has what what version is in their syllabus all of those are little steps that you can do so we want to pause think and reflect all right so this is our first pause think and reflect for about 60 seconds take time take a deep breath a drink of water whatever you need to pause and think about who have you been working closely with, with whom you haven't formalized um, collaboration? So what office could you maybe formalize a collaboration with that could benefit your office and the office that you collaborate with? Think about colleagues you touch every day, people you email the most, that you call the most. And you're always welcome to just write this down, keep it in your head, throw it up in the chat. What offices or departments have you longed to work with that this may now be the opportunity to? Six seconds left. <laughs> awesome. Congratulations. You've already been doing some work, even though there's overachievers on this line. So we know <laughs> they've been doing work since like 530 this morning. Uh, but again, hopefully um, you've jotted that down. But whom have you been working closely with that you haven't formalized a collaboration with that you can? All right, so another promising practice or tip we give you is find a campus keystone or, or a philosophy, a mission, a values, something that can be inclusive of multiple offices. So out of our policies, once we started looking at all of them, we literally summarized, and this is the statement. I'm going to read it to you all. It says students, staff, faculty, vendors, contractors, and guests have the right to a safe and respectful working, learning, living environment that is free from harassment, discrimination, abuse, intimidation, violence, and retaliation. Now we sing this like it is a top 40 R&B adult contemporary hip hop rock hook. We, this is in every PowerPoint. This is in every presentation. This is on every handout that the equity offices plus compliance give out. Because at the end of the day, if folks are hearing, seeing, experiencing us, and they walk away, we want them to know this, right? Living environment, our on-campus students, working, our faculty and staff, uh, and learning, our students. And, and again, it's important that it's harassment, discrimination, abuse, intimidation, violence, and retaliation. Before our collaboration, there was very little mention of retaliation. Shannon had that on lock in her Title IX, but as a campus, we did not talk about retaliation. And we are now because of our collaboration. Another promising practice uh, that we want to give you is find ways to model what you do. So, for instance, our offices provide equity services for inclusion. We join our services, we model inclusion with our offices, and we better serve students, faculty, and staff with intersectional identities. So what does that mean? Well, you all experienced that today in the way Sadie and I introduced ourselves. We didn't just do that for you, even though you all are very special. That is how we introduce ourselves during Welcome Weekend for first term, first year students moving in. That's how we introduced ourselves to colleagues two weeks ago when we yeah. uh, facilitated at 9 a.m. Uh, at our staff advisory council, otherwise known as SAC, which is an organization run by and for employees. So are you doing what you say you're going to do, which is moving out of the box or sharing identities, getting people comfortable and naming how they self-identify? Thank you, Shashan. And that leads us to our next pause, think, reflect. Um, we've got a couple here. So the first one is, is there a campus keystone statement? philosophy, mission, value statement that unifies the purposes of your offices? And second, 
Where can you collaborate on your campus or market similarities across services and units on a campus to provide more seamless services that are also more inclusive and serve populations with intersectional identities? 60 seconds to unpack that. Take, take a breath, drink a water, throw it up in the chat, write it down, or just, you know, keep it to yourself and, and really think about it. Think of your favorite song and or instrumental or that has lyrics. Think of the hook. What is the hook you all could be sharing across your campus? The chorus for those of you who can really sing, because I can't. I like that. The hook. The hook. Wow, 13 seconds left. All right, thank you for taking the time to unpack that question. Think about it. So we're going to take you to another part of our collaboration. Um, equally important is the reframing marketing and coming up with a call to action for ourselves. So one of the first things we did to reframe was to look at our web pages. And the very first thing we discovered is that our web page addresses were crazy. <laughs> they were really long. They're nothing anybody would remember. I mean, I, mine had like several front slashes, back slashes, hyphens, <laughs> the alphabet. Uh, <laughs> and no one was going to remember that. So we worked with IT and with our marketing to be able to shorten those and make them all similar so that students could type in www.stevens.edu slash DEI, ADA, or Title IX, and then find web pages that were similar. So we made our web pages look similar so that folks would be able to find similar things in similar places. And then each of those pages linked to each other into one overarching equity offices plus compliance page. Plus the bonus, remember we started out with our mission being to create one grievance process that we could all share from these pages, each one, uh, students, faculty, or staff are able to locate the reporting page to report incidents of discrimination. The second thing we did was to try to make ourselves easily identifiable. So numerous ways to contact us, phone, Zoom, email, in person, and we wanted people to know not just where we were located, not just what we did, but who we were as people, uh, so that, that human connection. And so we became very enthusiastic supporters of each other. So that, for instance, when students come to my office and need to be connected to Shoshan, I'm not just directing them to the inaugural Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and telling them where Shoshan's office is located. I'm telling them a little bit about Shoshan. I'm telling them about who Shoshan is when she leaves campus in the evening. What are her passions? Uh, what are the things that, as Shoshan would say, give her power? And then in so doing, I've made uh, Shoshan feel and seem a little bit more accessible to that student. So that's one thing that we've done for each other. The second thing that we've done is, um, this was just a fortunate coincidence, our names all begin with S. So we started to reframe and market ourselves as the S team or the S people or the super S or STEAM. And I can tell you, I think that has worked because just the other day, somebody knocked on my door here in my office. We're zooming to you live in my office today and, and said, you're, you're one of the S people, right? So that didn't know my name, didn't know probably what I did, but knew that I was part of a team of people who are supporting the rights and working toward equity and inclusion on our campus. Then we also tried to figure out ways to get really creative with diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, and belonging. So for instance, um, Shannon gives this really great presentation at the beginning of our semesters for first year students on sexual assault. And um, it's a really crucial time, Shannon says, to be able to get our first year students, because if you look at information and data, 
um, women are more likely to be victims of sexual assault in those first few weeks on a college campus. So how do you have that uncomfortable conversation and get students engaged in it and thinking about it? So um, Shannon and Shashan came up with talking about that consent is sexy, that Shannon is the person on campus who makes consent sexy. And yeah, our students giggle at that, they smile at that, but you know what, that actually gets through the taboo of the topic and it gets them talking um, and it gets them engaged in it. They sit up and they listen um, to that really important piece of her, of her presentation. And also, um, so for instance, um, another thing that uh, Shannon and Shashan um, did last semester in, in um, collaboration with the Student Development Office is during the Chauvin trial. When our students were seeing like um, images of the trial on social media, on screens, on their computers, on their TV, being bombarded by that, um, we thought it was time to kind of um, think of an event that would be sort of a release valve for our students. So uh, we all got together for a couple of events in our commons and were able to create art. So we just sat down at a table with a bunch of arts and crafts and created necklaces and bracelets. We painted. We breathed deeply, we connected with each other, and um, we smiled and uh, talked and laughed, and, and it was really needed. And it was you know, one of those out of the box creative moments. Then one of the last things we did, a really important one, is we created this three R's, and that is rights, responsibilities, and reporting. That became our call to action so that the entire campus community knew what we what we were behind, what we were doing, where we were headed with our work on this campus. So with rights, responsibilities, and reporting, we wanted our campus community to know, first of all, that we were there to protect rights, both federally mandated rights and rights that are afforded to our campus community through the policies and procedures of the college. For instance, Title IX uh, federally mandated to protect sex, but on our campus, uh, we also use our Title IX policies and procedures to protect gender as well. We wanted our campus community to know what their responsibilities were. So their responsibilities in terms of reporting acts of discrimination, their responsibilities as being mandatory reporters for Title IX, their responsibilities to be lifelong learners of diversity, equity, and inclusion on our campus. And then last, to know how and when to report acts of discrimination, whether it's something that they witness or it's something um, that occurs to them. We wanted them to know how, when, and why to report. So each of these things wound their ways into presentations for first year students. So all of our first year students, undergraduates, and also our first year graduate students get these facilitations. And we've also found ways to weave these into presentations for faculty and staff. And we now kind of have like a yearly schedule for these. So it is time for our next pause, think and reflect. Do you wanna read this one? Absolutely. So we're gonna do 60 seconds again. Would rights, responsibilities, and reporting as another hook work for your campus as a call to action? Or is there something else that's unique to your campuses, your environments that would work? So again, the three R's was something we wanted folks to know. I have rights, you have rights, I have responsibilities, you have responsibilities. We each have the responsibility to, to report. What would work on your campus? Well, seconds. They keep going <laughs> faster. I know. Works. All right. Thank you for taking that time to pause, think, reflect. And now, um, Shishan's going to lead you through the next several slides. Absolutely. And I do just want to uh, pick up on something that you shared um, that I don't think we formally put in here, but it was important to us, which is. 
how do you go ask for things that you need? So we went to the vice president mm -hmm. of academic affairs and said, we would love 60 to 90 minutes at the fall faculty yeah, conference and the spring faculty conference. That's how we got to what Sadie just shared about a schedule. We went to all the program chairs. We went to the deans and we said, can we have 60 to 90 minutes? of yeah. your orientation in order to present. And that's how we were able to make uh, connections with our counseling program, our MFA program, and all of our other academic programs, our, our uh, physician assistance program. Yeah. They call us or email us now and say, here's our orientation date. Are all three of you gonna be there? We've got a slot for you. So just wanted to make sure that was another way that you're gonna have to be intentional and you're gonna have to ask. So those of you who are not comfortable asking, collaborate with someone who is comfortable asking that this is what we want to do because we know the positive ripples it'll have. So a couple more tips. Uh, this is <laughs> something my colleagues hear from me all the time. It is the message and the messenger. So one of the things we did was be intentional about uh, shared facilitations as a way to you know, be on your campus. And that was online learning modules. Most of us have compliance stuff where you have to do sexual harassment once a year, bystander intervention once a year, something DEI, something ADA. So how do you have that going, the online learning modules for new staff, new faculty and students, but also do something else. Now, obviously this all happened during COVID, so we were strictly Zoom. But the last three terms, we have offered six free DEI professional facilitations to our campus. Students, staff, faculty, it's always an external facilitator. Uh, and that is because we wanted to be mindful of what our campus was missing, right? So yeah. I don't know about you, love a panel, love free professional development. That's the message. But what also engages me is whom the messenger is. Is it an Afro-Latina who's delivering? A DEI message? Is it a person with neurodiversion? That is an extra layer of the experience. So be intentional. That's an awkward conversation. When I came in fall of 2019, uh, Stevens was reporting about 30% people of color. And when I stepped on campus, I realized we didn't have one full time black faculty member. Right? Not okay with that. And so because of that, I am intentional that the majority of external facilitators I bring to campus are black and Latin, indigenous, biracial and multiracial women, women from the Asian diaspora, Middle Eastern yeah. diaspora. That is because our students aren't seeing that yet mm -hmm. in the classroom, but they can see it in facilitated experiences. So who is missing on your campus in your faculty and staff that you can be intentional in your vendors and make sure that it's the message and the messenger. The second one is the pathway to establish or increase your diverse supplier. So those same people I just mentioned also count towards our diverser supplier. And that is a, a new initiative. I brought it from my previous work. Um, and so it's definitely a work in progress from us. Some of us, some of you may have more robust uh, diverse supplier programs, but don't ever underestimate that. Who are your institutions? Who are your departments doing business with? Female owned businesses, people of color owned businesses, uh, visible and invisible owned businesses, uh, veterans, LGBTQI businesses, all of those have specific certifications. Why not do business with those folks? And the next one is collaborations with just more offices. So our formal office used to be called Human Resources. They've now renamed themselves as People Ops, and we offer things to them. Sometimes it fits with their strategic goal, sometimes it doesn't, but the series this term, our uh, five facilitations, are, are co uh, marketed. So arts people ops and the equity offices plus compliance. So pause, think and reflect. Think about the demographics of your campus. What types of external facilitators should you be seeking to bring their diverse lived experiences to campus to enlighten that discourse? This question is quite a mouthful, actually. <laughs> I think we could I could have edited that one down a little bit. It's the passion. Yeah. <laughs> so in other words, who's missing? You know, if you did a percentage or a dashboard of DEI of your faculty staff, who's missing? Well, then those should be intentional people you bring as guest speakers, facilitators, consultants, vendors.
just a few seconds left. Well done, you're moving and grooving. So here's a couple more questions. Um, what are some of the, the challenges on your physical plant? And this was, we wanted to create a map for future bold aspirations, right? Um, and so here we know we have a beautiful, gorgeous, old campus. Uh, it's also not accessible for people with temporary and permanent disabilities. So how do we do that? Um, we hope to do a major certificate, maybe in uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, justice, and belonging. Uh, scholarships and DAO speaker series. These are huge points that you all can talk to your board of trustees um, or your board of regents or, you know, whomever those fiduciary bodies are. If they're going to put their money where their mouth is, pre present possibilities like this. What other special initiatives do you have? Have you, one of our meetings, we just brain shared diverse cohorts of students. We just tried to make the exhaustive list, transfer, commuters, legacies, scholarship recipients, Right? In addition to the majors, age, socioeconomic, faith, right? Gender identity, expression, faith orientation. But think about those things unique. What about non traditional students? And how attractive are you as an employer of choice? Everything we've been talking today, hopefully you heard, it was students, faculty, staff, all together. So here's another one. Pause, think, and reflect. How can your entire campus culture benefit from what might initially began as student-centered initiatives and collaboration? Because that's the goal, right? So yes, um, students, for many of us, students are our why. But if we're gonna basically um, show what it is that we're doing and be able to illustrate that and how we build a campus culture, we want these initiatives to be campus-wide that everybody benefits from. So not only our students, but also faculty and staff. You're doing amazing. Around five seconds. Awesome. So we hope that helps you not to underestimate the power of collaboration and the power of being student centered. Because again, on a flow chart, you will not see equity offices plus compliance. It's Title IX, the Student Success Center, and the ADA coordinator, and the Office of DEI. But everything we all have shared with you all has been simply from decision making, intentionality, emailing, calling, uh, prioritizing our collaboration, prioritizing uh, learning each other as colleagues. So we thank you for your time, attention. Uh, with any time we have left, Jaron, we'll definitely ask, answer any questions. And we hope the pause, think, and reflect was helpful. Wonderful. Thank you both. Thank you, Sadie, uh, Shashan. I always love listening to you both. You, you both work so well together. And presentations were always, always awesome. Uh, don't have any questions right now, but we do have, if there is any that come in the chat, I'll forward those to you. Uh, and uh, we have about six minutes so uh, to get to the next session. Uh, so if you need to grab a cup of coffee, a uh, snack or whatnot, uh, please join us for the next session. Uh, you can go to our landing page and see uh, see what, what the next sessions are. Uh, but really appreciate your time today, uh, both of you. It's been really a pleasure uh, meeting you. Uh, and actually, we do have one. Hang on one second. Let me see here. Um, uh, from Selena, it says we are working on a few new reporting forms uh, for ADA, Title IX, etc. How do you publicize this information to students, staff, etc.? Great, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, I think web first. Yes, it's on the website. Mm -hmm. um, 
we're we're getting ready to embark on redoing our student handbook. So of course that'll be another one. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think trying to get in front of the academic programs, being a part of their orientations is easy because not only are you doing face name recognition, you put that information in there, send it as attachments or upload it. We use Canvas, upload it on Canvas so that it the faculty have it and the students have it. Um, and then I think we also, we show up to stuff. I mean, Sadie had done two sessions this term already with our with Alicia Sparer, who has facilitated before, um, our assistant director of the Student Success Center. They did two different journaling events with students at night. Mm -hmm. So that's just another way that that conversation happens. Uh, Sadie has taught yoga and meditation uh, for, for students in several classes. So it's the fact that we're also extremely involved. I'll be guest, uh, coaching for our soccer team this Saturday. And I always weave in <laughs> who I am, how I serve, and a little bit about the equity offices. So I hope that helps a little bit. Oh, fantastic. Great, great. Thank you so much. And we had another question uh, from, uh, from uh, Dr. Anthony uh, Snorgros. Uh, can you share your keystone statement? Is that, uh, do you have that uh, with you? Uh, the keystone statement, if you could share that Absolutely. And when we can always email it too. So again, if you look through all of our policies, they all have these pieces in it. So we basically summarized it, but it just says students, staff, faculty, vendors, contractors, and guests have the right to a safe and respectful working, learning, living environment that is free from harassment, discrimination, abuse, intimidation, violence, and retaliation. And I don't know if you all can really see it, but we tend to underline that last part, the harassment, discrimination, abuse, intimidation, violence, and retaliation in every PowerPoint, every handout. But that is part of our hook. And then the other one, which I didn't share in this one, but you all would know, is wherever your policies state whom you protect, right? We also sing that one quite a bit or wrap it or spoken word it to a lot of different people as well, you know, that talks about color, disability, gender expression, and identity, genetic information, origin, race, religion, sexual orientation. Because as we all know, every institution doesn't list or protect the exact same identities. Right. So these two, we pull out, we just had the board of trustees on campus and part of our orientation and retreat for them was going over these statements as well. Great, great. And I just added, uh, say I just added uh, in the private chat, uh, Dr. Anthony's uh, email address. He wanted me to forward that to you. Right. So, thank so you. we could uh, sure. connect with him. And uh, thank you for hosting, introducing us, and, and working the chat for us. We appreciate it. it so not a problem at all. It's, it's wonderful hearing you both. And uh, thank you so much for having. Thank you for joining so much for joining us today. And I hope you both have a good day. And uh, thank you all for having uh, joining us on this session. Take care. Have a good one. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good seeing you.